My name is Eric Atby. I'm an enthusiast for all things nautical and aerospace. I served for 22 years in the U.S. submarine force and have been supporting it for the last 14 years since retiring. I've been an aviation enthusiast since I was 10. Please join me while I pursue my passions through first-person experiences in history, exploring aircraft, ships, and historic sites that have changed the world, and for some that are truly off the beaten path. Welcome to the Museum of Flight, located on Boeing Field in Seattle, Washington. I have a real treat for you today, one of my favorite aircraft, the Boeing 727. The Museum of Flight is home to the very first 727. It was built in 1962 and entered service in early 1964. A total of 1,831 were produced, with production ending in 1984. As of the recording of this video, 60 years after entering service, there are approximately a dozen of the type still in commercial service. Now, let's take a look at what made this aircraft so successful. The 727 had many attributes that made it such a successful and popular airplane. These are, first, it was introduced with three turbofan engines in a tail-mounted or tri-jet configuration. Second, it had high-performance lift devices incorporated into the wing design. Third, it had the aft air stairs for passenger loading and offloading. Fourth, it had an auxiliary power unit, or APU, included in the design. Fifth, it had a common cockpit carried forward from the 707. And sixth, it had the same cabin configuration in the six abreast seating and dimensions that were common with the 707. The 727 was delivered with three Pratt & Whitney JT-8D low-bypass turbofan engines in a tail-mounted configuration, with the number two engine being buried inside the tail and fed by an S-duct. The new turbofan engines were more efficient, cleaner burning, quieter, and more powerful than the previous generations of engines. This is what the engine looks like underneath the fairings. It is a coaxial, or two-shaft engine, with the high-pressure turbine driving the high-pressure compressor and the low-pressure turbine driving the low-pressure compressor and the fan stages. Here's the fan stage. It is two rows but a single stage, a six-stage low-pressure compressor, a seven-stage high-pressure compressor, then the nine cantangular combustors, and then the two-stage high-pressure and low-pressure turbines behind. To meet customer performance requirements, the 727 debuted with several high-lift devices incorporated into the wing design. These included the leading edge Kruger flaps, leading edge slats, and triple slotted trailing edge flaps. This greatly reduced takeoff and landing speeds and distances. Now, let's see how this marvel works in action. Starting in the clean configuration, when the pilot selects the flaps to or the five degree position, the outboard leading edge slats will deploy. Then as it transitions through, once selecting the flaps five or 25 degree setting, the inboard slats and the Kruger flaps will deploy. Then following, as the wing finally goes down to its uh, final or 40 degree setting, you'll see that the uh, Fowler flaps actually have uh, three sections to them, so it is a, a engineering marvel. Now we'll walk around. This is what the leading edge slats look like uh, from the outboard portion of the wing. You can see that they form fit over the, the top of the wing and have a single position. They just either have uh, fully retracted or fully deployed. Now we can see this is the Kruger flaps. Those have a single position as well, but they are just, uh, they're not really an airfoil. They form almost an air dam, and then you just give it a greater cord to the wing to increase lift over that section. So just looking along the leading edge of the, the wing here. And that's the uh, landing light that you see at the uh, center there. Go ahead and take a, another walk around the outboard edge of it and give you a look back at the, the totality of the wing. Now this is the uh, Fowler flaps. You'll see that it has a, a jack screw that actually is what cycles it out and then the mechanical mechanism that actually gives it its positions are there in that uh, fairing. Good to zoom in on the jack screw here. 
and then you can see the actual mechanisms on the, uh, the bearing. And we'll kind of zoom back out here. You see the uh, starboard aileron, and then there is the uh, dump for fuel should the need arise. In order to meet the requirement of being able to operate from remote fields with uh, minimum support, the 727 had the aft air stairs, which were able to be operated by the, the crew and from external. This allowed for loading and unloading the aircraft without the need of a jet bridge. No conversation about the air stairs on a 727 would be complete without mentioning the most famous person to ever use them, D.B. Cooper, who in 1971 utilized them to parachute away with $200,000 in cash and has not been found. The 727 was one of the first commercial aircraft to be fitted with an auxiliary power unit, or APU. This was to allow them to operate from remote landing fields that did not have in infrastructure, uh, electrical, and or uh, starting carts. This allowed the APU provided compressed air to start the engines up and electrical power to run the aircraft on the ground. Uh, since it was one of the first aircraft to be fitted with it, it ended up being in a unique uh, location. It is in the port main gear wheel well. You can see here that it is uh, takes a suction from and then it feeds across to the through the center fuel tank, uh, tank number two. That's the uh, portions of it that you can see there. And then it uh, ducts up and out and out of the starboard wing through a little uh, opening with a grate that you see here. So... Uh, unique installation, but uh, quite effective. Uh, this is uh, Ted Hutter. He's the senior manager for the Museum of Flight Public Relations. He was uh, kind enough to grant us access to the interior of the aircraft here. And he's just making sure that uh, we are aware that there's a gap there to mind the gap, as you will. Obviously, the decor is uh, dated to the 1960s, but uh, you can take a look and see that it is a three by three uh, seating or six abreast, as you could say. Very small overhead bins, obviously, that back at the time, uh, having a massive carry on wasn't uh, the ideal thing to be doing. And you can notice how much extra headroom you have uh, as a result of it. So it was delivered in a two two class configuration uh, economy or coach and uh, domestic first. Uh, given the uh, the time frame, this was actually quite posh for, for the period, so domestic first class was uh, definitely a step up. Now we take a look at the uh, flight deck. This was uh, in common with the uh, 707, uh, two pilots and a flight engineer that carried forward to make sure that the uh, aircraft were uh, operated essentially the similar uh, 1960s lavatory. Uh, you can just smell the blue uh, stuff from here. And then we'll just take one last look through the aircraft as we walk back towards the uh, mid midships uh, exit on the starboard side. One good look back towards the aft, and that would be where you would exit through the, uh, the air stairs if they were being used. The vertical stabilizer is comprised of the fixed vertical fin and the rudder. They work together to control the yaw of the aircraft, the left-right movement. The rudder is split into four pieces. The upper pieces one and two work together, and the lower pieces three and four work together. The upper uses reduced pressure hydraulics from the A hydraulic system, and it is only used at lower speeds. The lower is on the B system and receives full hydraulic pressure when the flaps are down. With flaps up, the pressure is lowered through the load limiter since the increased pressure is not needed at higher speeds. You'll notice in the middle of the vertical stabilizer fin there are a series of small little uh, bumps here. Those are actually vortex generators. These are used to, because at slow speeds the air starts to separate from the control surface, i.e. a stall or loss of uh, control authority. So what these do is they create a series of very small, very tight uh, vortexes that adhere much better to the wing or the airfoil in this case and allow it to have better authority at much lower speeds to so essentially think of it it helps prevent a stall of the, the wing until further down into the, the, the speed regime so these actually helped out and uh, made the, the rudder more effective.
If you're ever curious how they loaded fuel onto the 727, here's your chance. The two red caps that you see there are removed and then hoses attached that provide pressurized fuel. It has uh, three quantity gauges and three selector switches, one for each of the three fuel tanks. So they would select which tank they wanted to put fuel to and monitor the quantity as it went in. So there, now you know. This is a exhibit that was provided by FedEx Corporation. This is one of their former 727 aircraft hull sections to show you what was underneath the floor of one of their aircraft or one of the 727s that was in would have flown. This just shows, uh, you know, the hull sections there. These are electronics and navigation and communications uh, bays. And you'll be able to see here, you know, obviously uh, not a whole lot of space. But uh, and you'll see some gyros here, uh, there. So 